the back going away. Is that right next to each other? Is that right next to each five other? People, so the size of the five people. table. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, and right. William was really excited at the time about this thing called Linux and open source software, and I really didn't get what the whole site was about. Um, so, yeah, thanks. Um, uh, first, I'd like to thank the organizers for um, inviting me to come talk on this. Uh, so, um, I'm going to talk about uh, some stuff I did starting about three years ago. So, it's called uh, Interactive Calculus and Sagelets. Um, I'm John Perry, as was said, and I'm at the University of Southern Mississippi in Hattiesburg. And speaking of small world, there's also another fellow here, Michael Pearson. He's also apparently from that area. <laughs> Every now and then we meet. Uh, and about this uh, thing, sagelets, I don't know if anyone else has ever used that word. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, some other people have? Okay, yeah. so I don't feel quite so bad now. But if anyone from Oracle or MapleSoft sees this and gets mad because Oracle owns Sun, which came up with applets, and Maple had these things called Maplets, please don't sue me. I have no money, so I'm not trying <laughs> to infringe on your trademark. Um, <clears throat> so um, we're going to have, I'm going to talk about three different things <laughs> beginnings, <laughs> development, and then some proverbs. Uh, Prehistory. So the origin of the project that I'm about to talk about, um, the chair of our department had this idea that he wanted to develop a textbook. He said lots of uh, departments were doing this kind of thing. And then we would publish it ourselves. And the students would buy our text, not the text put out by Cengage or Wiley or Cambridge or whatever. And then the benefits would be for everyone except the publishers. Um, it would be cheaper for the student and profitable to the department. And Departments are always looking for money, so it, was, it looked really good. Now, the chair didn't ask me. He asked uh, someone who I only called Copi number one, and Copi number one approached me for help because he, he knew I was good with maple and, and, and sage, and, or I was working on that kind of stuff, and so he thought I'd be able to help him develop some online resource. He was going to write some text, and I would write the online stuff. And then Copi number one also decided to approach Copi number two. Because uh, this guy had a lot of technological expertise and he thought it would be good to have him along. So that's the sort of prehistory of it. <clears throat> the strategy was, it was sort of floated that we would uh, write a, what's called a summer grant for the improvement of instruction. Uh, <clears throat> it's an internal grant awarded by our provost office and it always gets removed, reviewed by a committee of faculty which consists of past winners. And in our proposal, uh, we basically said, uh, we want to write a series of effective interactive lessons that allow students to practice and explore how different ideas and calculus come together. Some other excerpts. Uh, students, uh, oh yeah, a lot of students nowadays expect uh, all their homework, pretty much everything, to be uh, single task problems that have been fully discussed during class. So if I assign homework <coughs> that involves something that is not basically regurgitation of what they saw in class, they, they won't even start. I mean, if they don't recognize it, they won't do it. Um, I don't even mean they'll come ask me for help. I mean, they won't do it. <clears throat> they'll just pass on it. Um, so the suggestion we made was that well-designed computer-based lessons might be able to overcome this by guiding students through an interactive self-paced investigation. So <clears throat> it's sort of like if I were there, and if someone were to come ask me for help, then I might say, well, what about this, what about this, and, and slowly lead them to the problem. And so the idea was that the, by doing a computer-based lesson, you might be able to do that in person as the assignment. So the assignment would, in, in effect, have this kind of Socratic thing going on. And uh, the lessons can be designed in such a way that students who work with SAGE will simultaneously learn a few of the simpler techniques of computer programming. So I thought that would be a nice double effect. <coughs> Outcome. I, we actually won. We got a proposal. Uh, and I was really excited about this, for, not just because, well, it was a proposal and I got an award and that might look good when I came up for <coughs> tenure review and so on, but also because I had been told by several people in the department don't expect to win anything, including the other people on the, who were writing the proposal with me. And they said, you know, don't expect to win this. It probably won't happen. And then we won. So I was like, all right. <coughs> um, so we worked. Um, so summer 2008 was a bunch of work to do stuff like this. Um, so the development. Basically, there were three kinds of things developed, uh, modules, uh, labs, and sagelets, and I posted them online because that was part of it, and so if you were to go to this web page, you would uh, see this, um, and please click on that as soon as you get there. Don't spend too long because it's absolutely, I mean, I'll show you. If you go there, there's absolutely nothing interesting here, so just go straight to Calc. Whoa, sorry about that. Uh, just 
go straight there. Yeah. Um, so, oh yeah, and there are three kinds of things. There are the modules, the, the sagelets, and if you scroll down, laps. And I'll talk a little bit about each of them in due course. So a module, the idea was that was a tech-based, um, basically, you know, sort of like a lecture or a lesson, uh, or notes even, converted to it was originally made in J, uh, PDF, and then, uh, but each page was extracted to JPEG and then embedded in HTML. Um, let me actually give an example of that real quick. So, for example, if you were to look at this one, <coughs> you would get this uh, thing. You get an overview, and then it doesn't fit on this page, unfortunately. But uh, <coughs> and go on. But basically, whoops, I thought that said next. Okay, so, and often I tried to motivate them with sample problems, things like this, and et cetera. But it, you know, it's it something that, in fact, I was able to use during class, this kind of notes. Yeah? So at the beginning, the, the, one of the purposes of the, uh, the grant was to, oh. to generate revenue for the department. Yeah. Um, but you seem to be just Offering it freely online? Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering if this is sort of uh, Well, uh, I will get back to some okay. of these issues later. Yes. Can I, interesting, so at um, University of Washington in our state, if a professor such as me writes a book and students use it, yeah. we have to, um, it's kind of weird, we have to, we can't personally profit from any of the money the students spend, but the department can. Yeah, that any money I make, I can then donate to the department, which can then use however they want. I don't know if you ran into any similar issues. It's a legal, legal thing at the state level. Yeah, well, let me point out, first off, this was the chair's idea. Okay, uh -huh. the chair, it was the chair's idea to kind of try to, uh -huh. I mean, it, it, he originally wanted a book, an actual book that we could then publish through, uh, I mean, he had done this with like some conference proceedings. He had actually gone through, instead of doing it the usual route, he'd gone through some publisher he found somewhere and published that and then marketed himself. And, and, and the, the idea, yeah, the idea was the department could make money off that kind of thing. But that doesn't mean that's what actually happened. I'll get to what actually <laughs> happened later on, okay? Um, but that was just the origin of it. As far as what you, William, what you're saying, I have no idea what the rules are. I mean, I haven't written any book that anyone has published yet and so on, so I, okay. for us. Um, but anyway, uh, so the notes, the note, basically we, we sort of set up some notes and uh, that was supposed to, the idea of the modules is that they're basically sort of an exposition of the mathematics. They also tell you a little bit about SAGE. So usually in one of the modules, it'll tell you something about plotting or <clears throat> how to write a function, how to manipulate a function. We also did a bunch of stuff with lists and for, because after all, if you're doing stuff with limits, it's often useful to have a list and then to go through the list of numbers and do things on each element in the list. So all, these, all those elements of calculus are actually quite useful for uh, teaching some basic programming stuff. And uh, we introduced or reintroduced SAGE concepts wherever they were appropriate in the, in the discussion. So yeah, there was a basic introduction to SAGE module if you were to go back and look at it. Um, you know, so there is something that's an introduction to SAGE and stands on its own. But often a lot of that stuff is introduced or reintroduced also in, in some of the later modules that you know, I, I didn't want the students to always feel like they had to be going back and they were feeling like they were lost. I always tried to, to that stuff in there. Second thing was developed these things called sagelets. Basically, the idea of a sagelet is well, it's an interact. So <clears throat> you had a worksheet, and, and there's some kind of interact, and the idea was supposed to be interactive. And each of them was designed to illustrate a specific topic. So if we, if we look at some of these things here, uh, well, okay, function factory might not be helpful, but function squeezers, you might guess, that that was supposed to illustrate the uh, um, what you call it, squeeze theorem. Uh, something on limits for epsilon and delta limits, uh, limits at infinity, uh, stuff to do tangent lines, Newton's methods, and so on. So these were generally supposed to be really focused on a particular thing. <clears throat> they would be referred to by a module. So if you were going through the modules, it would say, now go download this, this uh, worksheet, upload it, and then we'll play around with it. And I would tell you exactly what to do. Um, so yeah, a uh, student ought to goof around with it. That was part of the goal. I mean, whether the, uh, whether that actually happened, I don't know. And actually, some of this actually led to in improvements in the notebooks. So there's, I actually looked it up. There's a track um, that uh, 
I introduced and I suggested something, but actually Mike Hansen ended up doing the uh, eventual fix that got incorporated. Um, now there was this, there was one big weakness with this approach was that students had to switch between various things and that's inconvenient. Uh, and finally there were labs. And the idea of a lab was, was a basic Sage worksheet that had text, uh, questions, and cells where students could interact with different things. And although a lab might focus on a specific problem, it was not necessarily a specific topic. And the goal was that it was going to be some kind of directed exploration. So you're going to go, here's some problem I'd like you to solve, work your way through it, and here's some various things you can try. And often they were both based on textbook problems. So a lot of them, they actually, I explicitly state, you know, this is based on some problem from Stewart's single variable calculus text. The eventual goal, like I said, was we're going to have an online text, so, you know, at least that's what we put in the proposal. Like I said, the chair wanted an actual text that we could publish. And that was also think, something I was thinking of doing eventually. Um, and so, but reason, one of the things I went online was I was thinking you can have varying levels of details determined by the student's needs. So that is, something I've had this idea for and I've never been able to do was, uh, you know, you have sort of this exposition of, of detail uh, of a topic. And then you're kind of like a file browser. We have these things you can click on, it'll expand some directories, the, the tree view of a file browser. So I was thinking kind of something like that. So you can have just this basic discussion of certain topics, and then if a student wanted more detail, like an example or a proof, you could click on something and it would expand more. Um, so that was, the, that was the idea that I eventually want to take this to. Um, the sage leads, what I really would have liked to have done was embed them in the text. That way you wouldn't have to do alt tab to switch between windows or even switch between various tabs in the browser. And um, I didn't realize the power of Sage Worksheet at the time. So we had these things were developed in tech, and, and, and the lessons were kind of in this separate thing, and uh, in, in this browser. And then you had the Sage Worksheets and the Sage lists that were in separate things. So I, I didn't really quite know about the embedded LaTeX. So I probably we probably could have done the whole thing in LaTeX. Uh, sorry, in the Sage Worksheets rather than have it in this separate thing. And, you know, so instead of like doing this, and then having to go through all these pages and then switch over to a browser, we could have just had everything in a browser in in the worksheet. Um, but that was something I learned while I was doing it. So, you know, that's one of the nice things about the project. I got to learn a lot about Sage. Um, so I want to do some examples real quick of some of the things we did. Um, Okay, so one of them was, for example, limits epsilon delta. I know it's generally uh, out of fashion to teach epsilon delta limits in calculus, and I've even been told by one guy that it's kind of irresponsible to do so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm attached to them. Uh, I like them, and I don't, you know, I don't want you to get the wrong idea. I don't require students to do much with them. Like I don't even ask uh, questions on tests, or students have to do it symbolically, but. The goal of this was this something I wanted to try. Was I wanted to actually do it? I wanted to see if students could get a better idea of it by just looking at how it works, so trying to visualize it in some way. And if I can get this thing to go down, okay. So basically, students were told um, estimate which values of delta will guarantee that f is within epsilon units of a limit. And what I really wanted to show is that what you're trying to do is you're trying to squeeze uh, the function to be between these two things. So. <clears throat> Uh, if you had delta too small, sorry, that's not the right, now I hardly remember the anymore so. Uh, oh yeah, so, <clears throat> let's just do it this way. If you had delta too large, is that it? Yeah, if you had delta too large, <clears throat> then your function would go into this red forbidden area. Okay? And that's because your y values were not between the epsilon they were supposed to be between. Um, so if you if you messed around with delta, eventually you could get it to be smaller, and you could change the function. So this is a particular function I was using, and you're trying to show that as x approaches one, the limit approaches one. <clears throat> and the idea was, you know, I would illustrate in class, show how it worked, and then students could mess around with it on their own, and I would give them some worksheet uh, to do that with. Um, another example is Newton's method. So in Newton's method, what I wanted to do was I wanted to show the actual tangent lines that were produced. Okay? And then once you hit a tangent line, okay, there's your root, now let's go here. That's what you use to do your next tangent line, go down. And you can see that it gets closer. 
And if you mess around with a function well enough, I can't remember any functions offhand where this happens, but if you mess around with a function well enough, you can also see examples where it just bounces around. Remember that there are some cases where Newton's method won't work. So <clears throat> one of the things you can actually do with this is, is, is see how various things change. Uh, and then there was something, the ripple effect uh, for circumference. So this is based on a famous uh, related rates problem. Okay, so you know, what's the relationship between the change in circumference and the change in radius? Uh, and this one, uh, you could very, very ma ma you could change various parameters and give you this table and even animate the thing. And what I wanted, what I was hoping students would see was that, for example, here dc dt tends to be a constant. Um, you can do the same thing with area and you can just try to guess what should the function be. Okay, and then some labs. Uh, so an example of some of the labs we wrote was, uh, this is one from linear to nonlinear approximations. Again, this comes from Stewart's single variable calc. So this is based on something in this book. And the idea is, okay, we do linear approximation. That's fairly well known and well understood. But, uh, but what about doing nonlinear approximation? So I think it just died. Well, the pointer just died. Oh, really? Thanks. It's okay. <laughs> it doesn't like me. I did. I swear I did. Okay. Um, so you know, I so I, I wanted students to work with it. Um, you know, they, they would learn how to use different things, um, solving systems of linear equations, setting up and solving them, and then eventually putting them together. And so, for example, here. You have a, there's a linear approximation, and then you start to see some of the nonlinear approximations, quadratic and cubic approximations. And then what I really liked was one connecting two highways. I was sure this would appeal to students a lot. Is, you know, um, if you have two highways, A and B, and you want to connect them using a third road, so something like from an, uh, from an interstate highway to, uh, to another road, um, what class of polynomial function would best describe the road? You know, what kind of things would you want? Um, well, you'd want... Uh, let's see. Uh, so the connector should meet the following criteria. Uh, well, it should meet at certain points, of course. They should, they should actually intersect. Second, uh, it should travel in the same direction as each curve. And then you'd want the acceleration not to change suddenly. So the idea was that the first and second derivatives would be the same. And then given these constraints, try to solve something. So, uh, and then you could try different things. So what if it's a linear function? Uh, what if it's a quadratic function and so on? Just keep taking it through until you get something that really works out and satisfies all the criteria. Um, so that was an idea of, of what we wanted to do, and there you see some of the things that actually came out of it. And now, uh, sort of the aftermath, I'm going to tell you in several proverbs. So first, a proverb my Italian grandfather used to say, il lavoro nobilita l'uomo, uh, which means, uh, wor uh, Work uh, makes man noble. No. Uh, in the whole project, I wrote one proposal, which actually won, yay, um, 27 online modules that are supposed to take one through calculus one, even a little bit of calculus two, but not very far there. Only so much you can do in the summer. Uh, 18 Sage Labs, um, lots of them using in Interact, and one report to the provost's office at the end. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> yeah, the more things change, the more they remain the same. Um, I actually tried it when teaching Honors Calc 1 that fall. Some students liked them, but quite a number of them rioted. Now, <laughs> this may have been just the particular character of a class. You know, sometimes it's just a class that works out that way. Um, but <clears throat> there were various reasons for it. Um, you know, there's also, David Pursued has sometimes talked about the effect AP Calculus has had on college level calculus. And one of the things seems to be is that students who generally take college level calculus one actually seem to do worse, especially if they've had AP calculus. And there and so an interesting question is why does that happen? And I think this is this is actually one of them. I think you mentioned this, is that they've had AP calculus once, they passed it in high school, they may not have taken or passed the AP calculus exam, but they come in thinking they already know what calculus is supposed to be. 
So you come in doing something that's completely different and they're not happy with it. They think they're in this class, it's just gonna be an easy A. Because after all, they got an A or B in high school calc, whatever. So uh, that was part of what happened there. Now, although some students, like I say, liked what was going on, and there was one student who the entire semester actually followed along in those modules that I had. So I was using them as notes and he would follow along as well. And so he was actually disappointed when I, when I didn't do any more with that. Um, whoops, too far. <coughs> Um, so I use the notes regularly, and I would assign, sorry, I still use the notes regularly, that's what that means. And on occasion, I'll assign one of the labs, um, but, uh, um, well, I'll get more to that in a moment. Uh, the chair of the department and the co-PIs never looked at it again, which kind of surprised me. Uh, other calculus instructors in the department weren't interested. I mean, I, I kind of understand. There's kind of an inertia. You're used to doing what you've done, and, you know, we have to worry about other things as well. A lot of the professors in our department teaching calculus are non-tenured, so we have to worry about research and things like that and publishing papers. So you don't want to wor worry too much. I mean, we also do web assign, and most of our professors won't do web assign because they don't, they don't even want to put that effort in because they have too many other things to do. So not too much happened. So the department as a whole was understandably more concerned with a publisher's grant we just received to set up something called the Math Zone for Intermediate College Algebra. A publisher gave us a bunch of money to buy computers as long as we would uh, um, require their book for those classes. So uh, we got a math zone out of it, and so the department was somewhat more excited about that afterwards. And um, uh, there was a non, and when I set up the modules, we used a non-standard tech class. I wanted to use Beamer, but one of the people in the group convinced me to use a, his custom tech class. And that was, so it's been a huge effort to just modify anything in there. Um, so, uh, I haven't ever since then changed it. <laughs> there is, in fact, I want to show you something. Is this one of the people that never looked at it again? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have this wonderful email from a fellow called Samuel Yadever that comes in February 18th, 2009. Uh, and he, he compliments me on it and he says uh, he, he, wants to he wants to report a few typos. And so he gives me this fairly long list of things. And I thanked him for it very much, and I told him, one day I'm going to fix them. Two years later. <laughs> yeah, two, three years later, it's still there. Uh, I do still plan to fix them one day. Um, why does that come up? Put them up on Bitbucket and ask them to submit a patch. <laughs> so <laughs> and then you can just one click video. and incorporate them. That's right. Um, okay, so uh, some follow-up. Um, one of the co-PIs wrote absolutely nothing to help that summer. He had help. He had health problems. Uh, the second one wrote two modules that had nothing to do with the proposal. Uh, I'm not going to say anything more, but um, and I'm not also not going to tell you what that Russian phrase <laughs> means. But uh, <laughs> this is from a very famous Russian show called Operatsya i Drugie Prisuchenia Shurika. My wife's Russian. And she told me this is this what? To nie rabote to jest. So That's actually a perversion of the actual Russian does phrase. It doesn't work. Taught, taught that, I don't know. I'm not going to tell you. Not <laughs> I'll tell you later. See, the thing is, we're, all, we're on video. I <laughs> when I found out it was going to be on video, I already changed. Yeah, right. Uh, so I don't, I don't learn from my mistakes. In fall 2009, I actually reworked another class uh, that we have called mathematical computing. And I wasn't going to say so much about this, but someone actually asked me about it. I, I he asked me about it on the way here. He said he was kind of inter uh, interested in it. So we have this class. Um, I don't know if it's unique to us, but it was it was done with an NSF grant like 15 years ago um, by a couple of people who are no longer at our institution. Um, and it was supposed to be something pretty simple. You know, introduce a computer algebra system using calculus-based projects. Students will solve mathematical problems in the, uh, yeah, I'm not going to tell you environment, that require an understanding of calculus concepts. And I decided, well, instead of doing it with what they were originally using, let's try it with Sage. And so I did that in fall 2009. Maple. What is Say what? What is Maple? Oh, that's, oh, that's a multivariable calculus, which should not have, which should not be a prerequisite for this class, actually. It really doesn't require it. Um, so we did a bunch of, this is the kind of stuff it does, problem solving based programming features of your algebra system. So I reworked it to do Sage, and the students really liked it. I mean, I've taught the class twice. The first time I did it with the other computer algebra system, the second time I did it with Sage. And uh, the students really liked it the second time. They had a lot of trouble the first time. 
partly because of the textbook. The textbook that they used for it, it was out of date. That other computer algebra system had changed quite a bit in, I guess, the seven or eight, maybe 10 years since the book had been published. And um, even so, it had some mistakes. So uh, the students really liked it. And there's no textbook at all. Well, that's not true. I actually use a, a Python programming textbook to go with the class. So there's a Python programming book. And then, say what? I will tell you. Art of computer programming? No. Or not art, I mean. Like, computer computer scientists. Scientists. Right. Not that one either, sorry. Um, <laughs> we like the there we go. Python. Python program. Oh, oh, is that the one you were just saying? No, no. Okay, no, there you go. Zelly's book on Python programming. Huh. You liked it? It worked pretty well, yeah. Uh, that's, right here. Here. Oh, that's it, yeah. I have it right here. <laughs> Got it. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, it worked really well. I mean, I, How do you I like it? Really How do you like it? Yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's guiding me through. Yeah, I mean, I have huh. to make some changes every time. I have to tell them, look, you can't do certain things. Um, one of the problems, I'll just say, one of the difficulties I've really had um, is that almost all students have Windows. Uh, our lab has Windows. If you're going to run Sage, it has to be within a virtual machine. VMware does not allow you to transfer text files uh, from the regular desk, from, your, from Windows into, uh, <coughs> into the virtual machine unless you pay money. Okay. Um, you can't even put them on a USB key. So if I wanted students to edit text files in Windows, um, you know, in a graphical user interface or whatever, and then run them from the command line, they can't, not on Windows. At least I did, couldn't figure out any way. I think I even asked online in Sage and no one was able to give me a way to do it. So to be able to share the, the directory, you can definitely do that with VMware. You have to pay. Workstation. Could you email it to yourself? Yeah. The question is whether you can do that with the free version. How do you get how do you get an email from the virtual machine? It's a good business. Virtual box. Virtual box will let you do that stuff. Virtual box will let you share a directory with Windows. Not that. Okay. So, so the documentation for how to do all these things with Sage is you know, with Sage. With well, Sage, right. right. I mean and it's unreasonable to expect people to virtual search box. through all kinds of random documentation. I mean you need better I now I don't mind doing that. I, I did notice you guys changed to virtual box at some point. And then change back. And then change back, right. And I didn't I I didn't get a chance to actually look at whether we would do with virtual box and that might be something I'm gonna look at because one of the students who was really really liked it, she asked, you know, how can I make this work in Windows transferring files over and stuff like that? And I said, Well I don't know how and, and so that was a problem for her because she knew that in the real world when she got a real job she would probably have Windows computers. Um, uh, uh, <coughs> you're starting to use this in Sage, but in, in Western University, is there like a policy that is for the engineering class to use MATLAB, so, or, or another software, so then maybe it's, would the, to take this to a different path, would that be a public for We don't have engineering. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, a prime, we're, we're, um, I mean, we're not a liberal arts school, we're, we're a comprehensive university, but, um, but we don't have a school of engineering. So would there, there would be no follow-up class after this one? Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. The, yeah, there's no follow-up class. I mean, one of the ideas, I think, the reason the guys developed it was they wanted there to be, a, you know, they wanted students to be able to take this and use it in other classes. But um, that, I mean, the math department had never done that. And, and it just, no one had ever worked on it. So uh, one colleague, now, uh, this one was a bit more successful, I'd say, than the other project. One colleague actually adopted it. So there are three of us who teach this class. Two of us in the Hattiesburg campus and one on the coast. The one on the coast really liked it. He, want, he didn't like the other computer algebra system and he wanted to try this. And he's using it right now this summer. And he, he says he loves it. Uh, so this, this worked out pretty well. But the department's currently involved in depart curriculum revision and the current plan is actually to eliminate this course. So, uh, well. Sounds like a perfect prerequisite to modeling course, for example. Yeah. We don't have modeling course. Well, that's not true, we actually do, but no, it's never taught. So uh, I'm not even sure. It's I think I was told it was designed for non-math majors, and for various reasons, there aren't so many non-math people who are taking math courses anymore. Uh, this is kind of a pet peeve of mine. Um, uh, well, okay. So for example, we used to our statistics and linear algebra courses used to be much more, uh, and differential equation courses used to be much more populated, but other departments for various reasons start teaching their own version of the course. So, okay. uh, and uh, so 
But now, just a bit of an under uh, aftermath, and just as a, a note, especially if you're non-tenure, keep this in mind. Uh, I didn't get much research done that summer, because like I said, I was actually the only one who worked on the project. Um, no mention of the summer project ever came up in evaluation. If I would put it down, I put it in my CV, and I mentioned it in parts about teaching, but no one ever puts an evaluation. I didn't get any credit for it, and when I was up for promotion last year, it was not mentioned by anyone in any of the reviews. Uh, in fact, I was criticized for insufficient research despite meeting department, I, mean, I met the department requirements. And I was actually asked, are you pure or computational because that will have an effect on how you're evaluated in the future? Which I thought was weird because the department had just gone over a big fight over this kind of thing. And apparently the people, well, never mind. <coughs> I'll just stay out of that. So I, I kind of caught wind pretty soon that uh, this was not going to get any kind of credit. So I, I turned to research, and I've done nothing on it since then. And I've been kind of successful. I was at ISAC 2011 last week. So if this presentation seems like it's not really informative enough or helpful enough, I started working on it last night because I was panicking over ISAC most of the last few months. So I'm, I apologize for that if so. So the project is effectively more of one, and I'd like to pick it up again one day, but uh, I don't know that I will. So, uh, that's Kenny. Thank you. Thank you. During the question. It's sort of the obvious question. If you have a project that's sort of more of a, you're supposed to put it on public server and, you know, the standard thing would be to release the entire thing under a standard open source license with a, re with a revision control system. I mean, it's, it's one thing to have links, but it would be good if you could, you know, package it up nicely so it's in directories and you have a revision control system and it's on, say, Google code or something like that. Yeah, I'm trying to figure and out. And so, like, you kind of, it's a thing that exists independent of you completely. Yeah. And you're like, okay, community, step up, that okay. sort of thing. Can we help you do that yeah. over the next couple of days? Yeah, it would be a good thing yeah, to I'll do here at this workshop. Okay. I mean, what, actually, one Unless, of the there's one of the things I thought I might do, of the grant. since I was here, I figured since I was here, I might as well try to convert all these things over to Beamer, and that might make it easier for other people to mess around with. Yeah. Because yeah. there are a lot of, I mean, yeah. there are some things I look at in here, and I thought, what was I thinking when I wrote that? Because, I mean, it's just dumb. It doesn't even make mathematical sense in some cases. And, uh, I mean, I've heard of typos, but this is <laughs> not even right. So, um, I'm gonna, that's one thing I'm going to try to do. It, and then I mean, it sounds like you're, you're I mean, from your talk, it sounds like you're going to have a bunch of people that are mad if you make it all licensed very open because they're trying to, you know, keep control of it for themselves. Right. Yeah, because that's not what seems to be happening. So. Yes. Jennifer, Eva, are you going to ask about the calculus textbook side of things? Uh, I, I was. I was actually going to ask if we could put a link to this web page on the uh, schedule where there's the oh, links. Yeah. Numbers. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes, you yeah. can do that. Yeah. On, on yeah. the wiki. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do it. I, so I, I want to. You should talk to the following people. First of all, the interactive things. So they're currently working, I don't know if you know that, on making the interacts working from within a web page that without any extra thing. Solving the problem of, well, no, it doesn't exist yet, right? Or, it's so, but solving the problem of having to log into the new system, right? The, um, the issue of the, the text going back and forth, Rob's going to talk about. Um, there's so almost all of the problems that you're talking about are ones that are solvable now. And so the research, and <laughs> yeah, I mean department one. No, but all the problems <laughs> for in terms of the teaching, including I think some of the issues in terms of like you know how you would approach it with the students. Um, yeah, this this sounds like a fantastic project for the the whole community to kind of take up. And uh, and Eva's been talking a lot about the open source calculus textbooks. She's a different type of pedagogy that she's interested in, but to have this as a resource available. Yeah, I, I, I want to ask what I mean, those are some, I, And then you, you guys, could embed web work into them. You guys, there are. <laughs> we can do that too. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, that was something else, that's something I talked about a little bit with John Travis, it's something we, we hardly thought when we do, that's one of the things we talked about. That's, that was something that we're happening. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, there are a bunch of open calculus. I mean, one, another reason I actually dropped this topic was, I began to notice there were a lot of open calculus textbooks Around. So, like someone pointed out to me, something like Orange Grove Publishing, some, some University of Florida consortium, or something like that. They're putting out a lot of open source calculus textbooks, and so I mean that might be something you want to look at too. But they're they're taking open material to that sort of acting as a publisher as a place. Yeah. Okay. So, so they have picked up my book, and you can get a print on demand from them, and I have no idea how or why. They never talked to me. Oh, fine. 
that's, that's a yeah, well, big difference. They have some calculus stuff, too. Yeah. yeah. I just want to say, you know, I've looked a lot for whole bench calculus textbooks, and there are a number, but I think there's still room there because, mm -hmm. you know, like, for example, the string text would be far too advanced for my students. Um, you know, there, uh, there, there are also like room for um, specialized like applied calculus text, mm -hmm. different pedagogies and stuff. I mean, I definitely think that there's there's space for this. This other MIT book, Calculus for Artists, is not a, is, is too low level, right? Like I wouldn't want that either, right? Um, so, I mean, I think that there's certainly room for this. Okay. The course you mentioned, if anybody else is interested in a course like that, or you, I think William, <coughs> frankly, but I think the book William has been working on this quarter might work real, real well for a course. You mean the mathematical so, computer? The mathematical computer course. So if you're looking for a, a sage type book to, me to mesh with something like that, yep. I think William, that's what, that's the kind of audience I think William's trying to target with that. So yep. that's something to be aware of. Basically, students that don't know much about mathematics in particular, but they kind of have some tiny amount of programming background as the target audience. Or maybe a, they, have a, they have a programming background. They, they played with the programming language enough that they feel like they know it. But it doesn't matter what language. Yeah, I mean, That's the target audience for that book. And uh, math Quebec for that? Class. Well, it doesn't really use any particular math, but there are examples involving math. And at least one example at least one section or one example will lose some subset of the students. But they're mainly at the end. Like the first two thirds is just general Python and Cython and stuff like that. And there's a lot of numerical stuff with NumPy and Cython. Because of the applied, typical applied audience you end up getting. Yeah, our, our, the students in our class actually have no, not necessarily any programming background. We do have a requirement for our majors to take a programming class. And in fact, in the curriculum revision, one of the things I suggested was, look, maybe instead of doing computer programming, instead of requiring our majors to do a computer programming class, why don't we uh, have this as their computer programming yeah. requirement? But that, that didn't apply. So that, there was a reason for that. I can't remember what it was. It might be because of our licensure students. Also, there's this Interact library that Jason's working on this summer. Um, I mean, again, some of the, I, I've looked at them before and I've sent people there, so I know these are really high quality ones. Should get a lot of them and save you from the Do you mind if we go back to the virtual machine issue for a moment? Sure. Um, I just put 4.7 on this Windows machine here, and I had to use virtual box. We switched. Right? Yeah. So we'll it switched switch back, back again. to yeah. virtual box. <laughs> Wait, so what's the current image that's being generated? Apparently, it's virtual box. I thought that she had to use. Is that Volker? Yeah, Volker Vol 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 is, yeah. Right. Vol 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 is, yeah. Vol I don't know it, but that's what's on it's a pretty recent. Myself. It's a pretty recent release. Yeah. So. And the documentation online hasn't caught up with with the fact that it uh, no. we saw it three <laughs> different times back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> no, we did not. We did not. I mean, no. There's a link to a, a like you said, Carl Dieter. There's a link to a thread of discussions yeah, where you can find that's out that that's what. That's you not good enough. Okay. Um, okay. Can I ask why? Uh, why the switch back and forth? I, I mean, the, I didn't really follow that conversation. <laughs> I'm sure there's good reason. I, I just. VMware sucks sometimes, VirtualBox sucks sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> like, Seriously, VirtualBox had some like weird stability issues for a while. Okay. When it was, I mean, we were trying to use it, but there were so many issues with it, they kind of got ironed out. And VMware was pretty rock solid, but it has, you know, it has these constraints for the free version, um, yeah. <laughs> which I never noticed because I don't use the free version. I have a oh. license. Okay, so since I'm on a soapbox and on, on video, yeah. let me take a moment to say, um, I think there's a good possibility for Sage to expand in places like, well, to, to get a foothold in places like Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, basically places that are uh, where education is often not well funded, doesn't have a lot of resources, because I mean, the states themselves actually don't have a lot of resources. <clears throat> um, so if, if there could be some stability there in, term, you know, in, in terms of how to access it through Windows, that um, that would probably help a lot. Because like I said, one of my students, she was really, one of my really better students who's probably a teacher now somewhere, she was really interested in using it, but you know, for, for her it was essentially a non-starter that she couldn't be able to transfer files back and forth. Maybe some of that documentation could be part of the utmost thing. I mean, that's part of the reason for utmost is to uh, institutionalize and make it easy to institutionalize. So 
scare those who are undergrads or graduate students or at different kinds of places. At, at some institutions, um, and yeah. really it should be at USM, since it's not the top level, you know, research one uh, side of the University of Mississippi, Mississippi State, they, these things would really would count quite a bit, uh, particularly with the huge amount of resources that are created. Um, so not just to let others know, that it's not a universal. I, I mean, I think, I it's think, unfortunate for you. I think it case. depends, I, I think it depends on several things. Uh, it, it, there's probably a good argument to be made that I didn't really sell this very hard when I came up for promotion. I mean, I, I basically looked at it as, okay, these are the requirements, these are the requirements here, and I've met them. And it kind of came back at me, well, you, you know, you've only done the minimal. And, you know, I've got... You know, also, like I said, I, I mentioned that some of the other guys involved in the project did either nothing or next to nothing. And yeah, they had reasons. You know, like I said, one of them had serious health problems, and I think the other one was actually in another country for most of the summer. So, you know, and I never I never made a point of telling anyone that look, I did all the work on this project. That took a lot of my summer. You guys asked me to do this. I, I never did that, and maybe I should have. But it's not gonna be an issue for me in the future anyway. That's all I'm not. Water under the bridge. Does that mean you got tenure? I've been promoted, and I, so we actually you can you can apply for promotion one year in your fifth year, and it's not considered early promotion. So I, I, I applied, and I was actually promoted. So next year I'll apply for tenure. The only concern was, well, your kind of publications are borderline. I've had like three new publications this year, so it's, <laughs> <coughs> that's not going to be an issue, I think. Yeah. Um, the other the other comment is that. In my experience when you do new things and so on, you do get a lot of pushback from students. And I, I used to think that you just taught your course, but back to teach your course in a larger environment. And so when you do something three years in a row, the third or three semesters in a row, the third semester is really different from the first semester. <laughs> almost every single time. And you would think the deans would know this by this time, but and some of them do, but not all of them do. And you learn what doesn't work in your own pedagogy too. Well, you know, that's it, it's, it's both the students and you. you know? Part of it is that you've learned some things, and you yeah. expect that part. But I've come to realize that a lot of it is that the environment that you're talking to now is really different. So with web work, which is the thing I have the most experience from, you know, if just one professor is using web work, it's very different from if three or four professors are using web work. If just one is using it, then there are students say, oh, well, no, no. Talk to other students and say, oh, we don't have to do all this. We don't have to do our homework. It's not automatically green and things like that. <laughs> and you get these, this kind of pushback. Whereas if you're in an environment where web work's been used for four or five years, students say, oh, this is how you do it in college. And they, they, they help each other. They talk to each other. And this is the expectation that they have. So it, it, it's a matter, in some sense, of making clear what expectations are. You, you can also improve this. I'm not good at it, but you can improve it if you're really explicit about telling the students that, you know, I'm going to try it this way, and here's what it's going to be like. Mm -hmm. The thing students hate most is when they're not expecting what happens. And, and I have to be a little fair, too. I mean, I, I am not generally an assertive person, and I was not assertive at all with this project. I mean, I was asked to do it, so I did mm -hmm. it because I was asked. And I haven't, I have, I have not pushed at all to try and keep it going. So, you know, it's, I mean, I haven't even written a grant, you know, try to get external funding to continue it. Mm -hmm. And I, I had thought of it, and I've, I've actually talked to some people about it. It's always kind of tentative, yeah, sure, let's do it, but then it always falls through for some reason or another. So, <clears throat> you know, I, I, I don't, I don't want to make it sound, I don't want my department to sound bad. You know, they were, they did have other big concerns. And, so, let's do Jason and Eva. Take a break. On this note of trying something new, and I guess a lot of us will be trying new things in, you know, in coming years, Arnold Lebo, I think, was the one in our prep workshop that gave some very wise advice, I think. He said, yeah. before you try something new, 
go talk to your dean and tell them three things, what you're trying, what the students are going to tell the dean, and how to answer those questions. Like, yeah. <laughs> and you know, prepare the dean for the student, or, or your maybe chair, your department or whatever, chair too, or right? Whatever level. Is it, Whatever level you need to go to, that's right. So that, I mean, because they're trying to encourage people to try new things and whatever else, at least in my university. But if you prep them for that, then it's then it's much easier for them, the university to present a consistent front for the students to realize consistency and for you to sort of be backed up, both on a professional level as well as with the students. Um, yeah, I've encountered exactly the same issue with the, the environment uh, of that the students are expecting affecting uh, their reaction to what you're doing. Um, I have a variety of resources that I can give you that will probably be helpful for your tenure application, so we should talk about it. Can you put those up on the, I mean, I'm coming up for tenure in a couple of years yeah. too, so. <laughs> but I, I mean, it's, like it's along the lines of the, the advice that you just, well, good. just, but things that people have said that you can sort of hand in as documents, like, it's not just me, other people <laughs> But it, it's also something that, you know, when, when you first do an experimental thing, I think expecting to be thanked right away is, is just, just not in the cards. And so you have to kind of realize that it's going to take a while before yeah. these things catch on. Um, I mean, I've been doing the web work thing now for 13 years, and I didn't expect it to be that long. <laughs> <That's my experience. laughs> and I, no, it didn't take that long to get thanked, but uh, I expected to be out of this long ago. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 just, I, didn't, I, didn't, I just didn't expect what did happen. Yeah, before. right. No, I understand. Yes. Okay. All right, let's thank John again. For <laughs>